All right, well, welcome to our sermon uh, in our sermon series, A Journey of the Altars. And uh, what an interesting uh, week it is. Uh, so this week, we're going to put our attention on Joseph. And most of you might have realized, if you look at the scripture ahead of time this week, you might realize that Joseph didn't build an altar. So how is he in our altars series? Uh, well, that's quite a... Quite a good job on your part, if you were to notice that. Um, but the reality is that Joseph is pivotal to the altar series. And you're going to find out why throughout this sermon message. Uh, you're going to find out why, even though he did not build an altar, of why he is pivotal, not only to the story uh, line of where God is and his will uh, for everybody, but also how he's pivotal to the journey of the altars series uh, throughout this message. So today... We're going to dive into Joseph and his message. But we must first find out a little bit about who he is, the importance of Joseph. And uh, really the key verse here is going to be Genesis 37, 2, of why he is so important to the message of the series. See, his story is truly fantastic. He was loved by his father. I mean, beloved by his father. So beloved by his father that it made his brothers completely jealous of him. Completely jealous of him. So jealous, so envious of their little brother that they really said, hey, let's throw him in a pit. Sell him into slavery. So envious, so jealous of him that they literally sold him into slavery. That is the Joseph we're talking about today. But there's also something really great about Joseph's story. And maybe, maybe we miss that sometimes when we read the story of Joseph. We think, wow, what a great story if we see the end already. But imagine not knowing the end. So we can see that it is maybe unexpected to us if we were living through the story. But it's exactly and precisely what God's plan is and was for his entire nation, for Joseph. He put in his bed, he sold into slavery, and all that goes with it. When you think about Joseph, as he walked through life, he had many difficulties. But as you, if you've understood the story, you understand he's very blessed in his life as well, which is kind of the nice, Mixture, uh, he was a lot of difficulties went on in his life, but the blessings were heaped upon him abundantly, to the point of almost unbelievable how blessed Joseph was. So let's give you a snapshot of it. If you didn't get a chance to kind of read through his story, the quick snapshot is this: as a teenager, thrown into a pit, sold into slavery. A decade or so later. He became the second most powerful person in Egypt. All of Egypt. After being put in that pit and sold into slavery. And then, one of his probably crying, crowning jewels of his life, much like any father in the room would say, he was a father to Manasseh and Ephraim. Not only serving God faithfully throughout his entire life, but being a father is very important as well. So Joseph had all these wonderful things happen to him. In the end. But you think about his teenage life. And all the years that went through that were quite difficult. So he looked later in life and his sons are born. He specifically named one of his sons Ephraim. And that name means this. Fruitful through afflictions. And the word afflictions translated is also suffering. So we think about that. Joseph made his son faithful through afflictions to represent who God is to him and who God was to him throughout his entire life. We must know about Joseph in order to really understand the journey of altars and how it completely comes full circle in just one more sermon. 
In the beginning, in 37.2, Joseph was a teenager. And the verse goes like this. These are the family records of Jacob. At 17 years of age, Joseph tended sheep with his brothers. The young man was working with the sons of Bela and Zelpha, his father's wives. And he brought a bad report about them to their father. So not only were their older brothers jealous and envious of their younger brother, but now the youngest brother was also spying on them for their father. That's not a good mixture when you think about some already jealous brothers. So if you start there and you think about Joseph's story, you think about how God was completely fruitful and faithful to him throughout his entire life, you also see he's about to go through quite a bit of suffering throughout his life. Now think about that suffering, and it's going to come up a lot throughout this message. And maybe some questions for us is what kind of sufferings are we going through right now? When you think about that statement, what comes to mind for you when you think about the sufferings you might be going through right now or you have gone through? Because the difference we're going to see today in Joseph is how he reacts going through suffering. Now, unless you all are perfect, which I'm sure most of you are, at least 99% perfect, you probably don't react very well to going through suffering or difficulties. I think that is why Joseph's story is so important. So important to see and hear how he walked through his life under tremendous, tremendous suffering. Now, Kind of the moral story, and the point of the story maybe coming to today, and maybe the question I'll come back to, is if God can do that for Joseph, can he do it for you in your life, and what you might be going through, or continue to do what you already have been through? Is God that good and that faithful? So let's dive in truly to what the message looks like today for us. When we think about that, this is my first point here. Is despite rejection, Joseph remained faithful and became fruitful. And there's all the different scriptures I'll kind of reference today for you. I can send them to you in an email too if you really have all of them down. Some of them I'll read out directly and some of them I'll kind of reference. I want you to know where it came from. When you think about that, despite rejection, with his brother so envious and so jealous of him, they sought out revenge. And that comes from Genesis 37, 4 through 5. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not bring themselves to speak peacefully to him. Then Joseph had a dream. When he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. I mean, they already were not nice to him. I mean... You think you catch the hint when your brothers aren't very kind to you. I mean, Jacob, do you have any scenarios that might play out for you in life? Uh, when your <laughs> brothers are older than you, right? And you see this throughout life. And now, he had a dream about how he was going to rule over this. I can see some brothers being pretty angry about that story. But not only were the enemies in their hearts, but they rejected Joseph through, his, through their betrayal of him. So 37, 12 through 31, when you think about that, his brothers had gone to pasture their father's flock. Mm-hmm. Israel said to Joseph, your brothers, you know, are pasturing the flocks at Shechem. Get ready. I'm sending you to them. So Joseph goes out to his brothers. He did exactly what his father tells him to do. The beloved son to listen and obey his father. Goes out to his brothers. But then in a distance, the brothers are thinking about their little brother. As good, envious, jealous brothers would do. And when they seen him off in the distance, their hearts boiled even more. 
so much so, they wanted to know if he was really going to rule over it. He really felt that way. And I'd say that Joseph really felt that way. He felt like the dream was from the Lord. And it was. It was a foresight to what was going to happen in life. Just not immediately in the current state of things. When we think about that, his brothers burned. And burned deeply. That envy and jealousy for their little brother. So deep that they have to plan to kill him. But thankfully, he had two brothers that loved him, but still hated the fact of him. So here's the good part of the story in verse 21 and 22. When Reuben heard this, he tried to save him from them. He said, let's not take his life. Reuben also said to them, don't shed blood. Throw him into a pit in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Intending to rescue him, of course, from them and return to his home and his father. And then thankfully he had a brother Judah also, who said his brothers to his brothers, What do we gain if we kill our brother and cover up the blood? Come on, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay a hand on him. For he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. So thankfully. He had two brothers at least had some kind of sense of mind to him, and didn't let jealousy and envy totally ruin their hearts. They're like, oh, I don't think God would approve of this. And at least kept them alive, which is really what God's plan is. As it rolls out and, and plays out and throughout life, sold to the slaves, and then, not just the slaves, but then through a couple trades, found himself in Potiphar's house. The Midianites that bought him from the slave trade from the Ishmaelites then took him to Potiphar's house and sold to Potiphar and sold him in slavery there. Now, what an interesting place it was that he fell there. Because when God's plan plays out, we all kind of have an idea of what that story is if you've read any of the Bible. You understand where Joseph went from there. But can you imagine how he felt Rejected from his own family. Now, when you think about it in life, you know, some of us may have had that same feeling. Can you imagine the treatment from the slave drivers that were running him all the way to Egypt from his homeland? The treatment was most likely very horrible. But the great thing is, that is not the end of the story. God's favor was with him and has not been removed whatsoever. As you see in Genesis 39, 2-4, the Lord was with him, Joseph, with Joseph, and he became a successful man, serving the household of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made everything he did successful, Joseph found favor with his master and became his personal attendant. Potiphar also put him in charge of his household and placed all that he owned under his authority. See, what humans meant for bad, we're talking about his brothers here, God used to bless and encourage Joseph throughout difficult times. When he set out, he had these humans, these brothers, affecting his life, thinking that they had won. What they didn't count on is that God was faithful. What they didn't count on is that God would lead him in the right way. I love the depiction there where everything he touched, everything he did was successful. That is truly what God's favor looked like and does look like. So despite rejection, Joseph remained faithful and became fruitful. Now imagine, if you've ever been rejected by your family or friends or anything else like that, 
Is it easy to remain faithful? Again, maybe you are the 99% that is just completely awesome and amazing. You've never struggled in this. Or maybe you have struggled in this. Or maybe you're struggling with it right now. I think the story of Joseph can tell us a lot about who he was as a man of God. That despite their rejection, he remained faithful and became a good In the next little part here, we're talking about how that rejection led to accusations also. But again, we're going to see how Joseph remained faithful and became fruitful. See, Joseph was this overseeing the Potiphar's house. He was the go-to guy. He was the man. When Potiphar needed something, he knew Joseph would take care of it. He didn't have to think about it whatsoever. When you think about that chapter 39, verse 6 through 7, it says this. He left all that he owned under Joseph's authority. He did not concern himself with anything except who he ate. Now Joseph was well built and handsome. After some time, his master's wife looked longingly at Joseph and said, sleep with me. That's what happened with Joseph, a slave who was in this amazing position because God put him there. An amazing position because the master seen that he would be faithful and willing and able to be in charge of things. And it is Potiphar's wife who tries to spoil the lot. And so Joseph, as a good, honorable God, godly man, refuses the advances. But Potiphar's wife does not take no for an answer. Continues to pursue him, pursue him. And then when he refused again and again, she put out accusations as if he's the one that made the advances. And so he looked at that, that false accusation, he came on to me. Well, Potiphar's wife is a liar, by the way. We see that because of God's representation in this. The way he tells the story to us. But regardless of how faithful he was to his master, how faithful he was to God, it didn't matter because, guess what? He's thrown in the slammer. <clears throat> Even though he was faithful because of his accusation. In 39 20, and he had him thrown into prison where the king's prisoners were confined. So Joseph was there <coughs> in prison, rejected, falsely accused, and that false accusation destroyed his character and his reputation. And that is probably one of the most brutal challenges to overcome. But how did Joseph face it? How did he pull it together with all that suffering now again, rejected by his family, now thrown out by his master? Well, he faced it with a godly man. He remained faithful regardless. Regardless of what was going on. See, that tells us a lot about who he was. And also, as a story of God and God's Bible, like, it truly tells us maybe how we should walk our lives. The reality of what it means to when things are up against you. He could have been crying in a corner saying, Oh, that's wrong. I've been wrongly accused. Or... Nobody likes me, so I'm just going to give up. He could be saying all those things, but he didn't. He just put his head down and focused on what he can control, which is his actions. The things that he said, the things that he did, those are the things that he can control, but nothing else. And because of his faithfulness, you look at verse 21, he says this, But the Lord was with Joseph, and extended kindness to him. He granted him favor with the prison warden. So he was rejected. Potiphar's wife came after him, lied about him, thrown in prison again, and yet God's favor did not get removed from him. 
verses 22 and 23 of chapter 39 says this. The warden put all the prisoners who were in the prison under Joseph's authority. And he was responsible for everything that was done there. The warden did not bother with anything under Joseph's authority. Because the Lord was with him. And the Lord made everything that he did success. What a line. I just, I just love that phrase. Isn't this Joseph so awesome? On one hand, yes, at remaining faithful, but it's because God's so awesome. They didn't remove his favor from Joseph. Despite human interaction, he was still loyal and faithful to the Lord Almighty. And the Lord's favor was with him. And guess what? Same thing goes for us. It doesn't get removed from us. See, Joseph was rejected, accused, but he remained faithful. And that led to becoming fruitful again. See, now we have a rejected Joseph, an accused Joseph, and now we're going to see him being forgotten. These are all like the trigger words for all of us. I mean, I'm not the only one in the world that maybe sees these trigger words going, oh my goodness. Rejected, accused, forgotten. These words will bring shame in your body or your mind and your hearts if you allow them. But just as Joseph's story lays out, it's all about remaining faithful. Because his story continues. In chapter 40. I'm going to do a recap here because it's quite a large section of ch uh, verses. Chapter 40, verses 1 through 22. Here's a couple of recaps. He was in prison over all authority, over everyone in there. And in prison comes a cupbearer and a baker. And that cupbearer and baker had dreams. Joseph interpreted those dreams. And they became true. Exactly how the interpretations happen. <coughs> and in that understanding, here's the interpretation of your dream. Here's how it's going to come. Here's how it's going to play out. Joseph also, in verse 13, pleaded with the cupbearer. Now, I know this is going to come true because the Lord <coughs> said it, and so don't forget me when you are released from here. The baker, eh, not so much. Not going to be released. But cupbearer, don't forget me. How I interpreted your dream. Remember me when you go before the Pharaoh again. See, those interpretations came true. And the cup here was restored. And the baker, well, he was hung exactly as the dream foretold. If you go one more verse in verse 23 in that section, we see that yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph. He forgot. And that's how we get to these three things. He's rejected, he's accused, and he's forgotten. All the trigger words of our world that we live in today. Forgetfulness of Joseph lasted two years. I mean, the cupbearer got removed from prison because of this interpretation. And instead of saying, thank you, yes, I will definitely go to the Pharaoh on your behalf, he just said, ah, thanks for letting me out, buddy. Thanks for helping I really appreciate it. See, now we see this come to fruition of this rejected, accused, forgotten. Have you ever felt that way? Rejected, accused, forgotten. How did you react? Well, thankfully, we have scripture here to tell us how Joseph reacted. We understand that Joseph remained faithful. And that led to him becoming fruitful. The Lord never forgot him. And as a reminder, he will never forget you as well. But two years later, the cupbearer is standing before the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh is very mad. You fast forward to uh, chapter 20, 41. Pharaoh is very mad at all his officers. Pharaoh had a dream. No one could interpret. 
But finally, an aha moment. Finally, a reminder in a cupbearer's heart of his fault for not remembering Joseph. And he told the Pharaoh about Joseph and how he interpreted the dream. And so, in verses 9 through 12, he brings him up, interprets the dream, and guess what? What did the Pharaoh do? Pharaoh blessed him, encouraged him, because he knew the Lord was with him. And the favor that was on Joseph was realized yet again. He interpreted the dream. The Pharaoh was so overwhelmed at his intelligence and the reality that the Lord was with him that he could not do anything else but promote him again. And now this time, to the second, the most highest position in Egypt. He's the man standing next to the man because he could interpret this dream. And it was obvious to the Pharaoh that the Lord is with you. So wise, so wise, that he put him over all his household. All this sounded familiar? Every single time that humans tried to intervene and humans try to take Joseph out of the story, through rejection, through accusations, through forgetfulness, the Lord intervenes with his favor, regardless and in spite of humans. His favor was real on Joseph's life. And that favor wasn't just because Joseph is just so cool and what a good guy. But it's because his attitude through the suffering. And his attitude through his suffering was faithfulness. And that faithfulness led to his favor, which led to the restoration of his family. Full circle. His 11 brothers threw him in a pit, sold him into slavery, and now we see the picture of him being the second most powerful person in Egypt and overseeing the entire granary, overseeing a famine going on all over that every nation was coming to Israel and guess who's asked? They're asking for food. They're asking Joseph for food. Every family came there, even his own family came there asking for food, having no idea who they were asking from. <coughs> That position of favor led him to be able to be restored to his family and restored to his father. But that whole story led up to that being rejected, accused, and forgotten. But in spite of all that, he was still remained faithful and became fruitful. See, that's Joseph. That's his story. That's what it comes to, to be him and with him. But now in the back of your mind, you might think, okay, I, I know the story of Joseph. It's a really good story. I mean, it's a fantastic story about faithfulness. But how does that really relate to the altar series we're dealing with? Well, Joseph's journey may look like a detour from this series, but without Joseph's story, there is no more altars. Without Joseph being who he was, without God being so faithful, without him helping and assisting his family and his nation through the famine, there would be no more altars. There would be no more story. There would be no more of the worshiping God in the way that we see throughout the rest of Scripture. But this detour is a part of God's plan. Because God is always at work in the lives of his people. He is the one who brought them to Egypt, and he's going to be the one that brings the entire nation back out. Which is where the next sermon in the series gets. Where we see his son Manasseh 
building the next altar. We see his son, Manasseh, building that altar to honor God in the homeland that they were given and entrusted to by God. We may have a season in our lives that feels like Joseph. You know, rejected, accused, forgotten. But during that season, it depends on how you walk and how you talk and how you live your life. Are you remaining faithful to what God's called you to? The way that God can be trusted is exactly how Joseph trusted him with all of his suffering. Knowing that God is sovereign over every situation, through every moment. Sure, he probably was a little depressed in moments. Going through this again and again. But what it led up to is that Joseph, being the pivotal part to fulfilling the promise that Genesis 12 was given. 12, 1 through 3 says this, the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your land, your relatives, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt. And all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. See, without Joseph, that hasn't come fruition. Through Joseph's story, this happens. As we're going to find more about next week. When the nation of Israel, not just one family, all of the nation comes out of Egypt. Now Joseph had no idea about the story. He wasn't given full knowledge. Hey, you're going to go through some sucky times, but in the end, it's all going to be all right. He wasn't given that. He had no idea that Egypt wasn't the resting home for them right now. All he knew is he had to remain faithful to God all the time. That seems like an easy task. Now you maybe well know as well as I do, it's not always easy. Even though we know it's the right thing, we know that we have to remain faithful, we know that he's in charge, we know that he'll work all things to good, it's still not as easy sometimes. See, he didn't know that he was going to be the key part in God's story. He was just putting one foot in front of the other and remaining faithful to the one who called him. Now, Joseph told the best when he addressed his brothers. In chapter 50, verse 20. You planned evil against me. God planned for good to bring about the present result. The, the survival of many. See, God's, sinful, uh, God's sovereignty far outweighs the sinfulness of man. He's working all things for good. Throughout life, with no questions asked, He's working all things for good, even when we feel rejected, we feel accused, or we feel forgotten. Probably the important question for you when you hear Joseph's story is will you remain faithful? Always. Will you live your life as a living sacrifice? Will you, like Joseph, trust the journey to God who sees you and knows you, who knit you together, even though it may be very difficult? Life's going to be unfair, <laughs> I promise you. But even though all those things, even though you may feel unwanted at times, do you trust God enough to remain faithful? even in those very difficult moments. All those moments are like ages wrapped up in you. Where you're stuck in a place you don't necessarily want to be. You just want to be in the homeland. 
He's living through it already. Will you remain faithful to him? Even though it's not easy. What will you choose to do in your sufferings, in your afflictions? And that is why Joseph's story is so pivotal to us. When next we can see his son, Manasseh, build an altar. Because without Joseph's story, we have no Manasseh. Let's go to Lord in prayer, and we'll lean into our sermon follow time. And of course, our meal. Father, thank you for who you are and the way you encourage us, the way you guide us, the way you direct us. Thank you for allowing us to hear the story of Joseph and the way they can encourage us and guide us, direct us. That even though there are difficult times, even though there are times we're going to feel rejected, there's times we're going to feel accused, there's times we're going to feel forgotten, that you will not leave us. You are always faithful and you always shine your favor upon us. Father, may we encourage, guide, and direct you as your people. Say this in Jesus' name.